evening, ladies and gentlemen, and colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm really glad that I can welcome you to Kirill Malayevi, uh, Israeli journalist who was, and I can still is, a uh, kind of uh, special case and um, kind of hero for young journalists, at least at the time when I was doing journalism, he was one of those who were so different that we like his job. And it's fantastic that he is here because you know, not only that he is a different journalist, and I think his, his talk will prove it, uh, although he is in a let's say, special kind of relation with his country because his family comes from Czech Republic. Though not from uh, Czech British, but Jewish, German, or Czech speaking British, but he is actually kind of local. <laughs> so if someone here is sometimes upset that we don't have proper journalists, I have to say we have. Yeah. <laughs> but they work somewhere else. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a Yes, I, uh, I really feel, I have special emotions when I'm here. You must understand that I was brought up knowing that anything which has to do with Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, then is the same, is wonderful, is great. The music, the food, the beer, everything that we heard about Czech Republic was always so good. I even remember the basketball games between Berno and Maccabi Tel Aviv. My mother who had no interest in basketball. She was always in favor of Berno against Tel Aviv. Because she came from Moravska Oslava, which is not so far away from here. So I remember clearly those games between Berno and uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv. And I knew that I had to be also in favor of Berno. And who would believe that one day I will stand here in Berno, in the university, see my photo in the corridor with Czech writing, and it's really, it's very meaningful for me. It's also meaningful for me because the uh, Czech Republic uh, shows a certain way in the last years, about Israel, about the occupation, which uh, contradicts a little bit what my mother told me about the uh, Czech Republic, if I may say. And uh, it's really interesting and fascinating for me those days that I'm here with the activists to realize uh, the level of, I would say, even ignorance and brainwash in this country. Uh, with the, I understand, I, I can't read Czech, so I don't know, but my feeling is that the media is playing here a very, very powerful role in, uh, and in a way it is betraying <coughs> its duty, nothing to do with politics. And that's my main uh, subject today, because I will not speak about Czech media, I speak about Israeli media and its betrayal of its mission. But I, I understood from what I was told, maybe I'm wrong, but I understood what I was told that Czech media and Israeli media can find a lot of things in common and they are not very, very promising and uh, positive things, I am afraid to say, in covering or mainly not covering the Israeli occupation. So we talked today about the Israeli media. I'd be happy to answer then questions about any other topic. But we are here in university and I will really concentrate on this. And my first uh, assumption is, it's very hard to prove, but I truly believe that if without the collaboration of the Israeli media with the occupation, the occupation wouldn't have lasted for so long, for 50 years. The Israeli media is a free media, is almost totally privately owned, very little censorship, 
if at all, very little pressures from the government, but the Israeli media suffers from something which is ten times worse than censorship, governmental censorship, and this is self-censorship. The Israeli media is responding not to pressures from above, but to pressures from the knees. Because it became really a slave of rating, a slave of selling newspapers, and it totally betrays its leadership in the way that we forgot what are we about, what is journalism about. Is it about pleasing our readers? Is it about telling them what they expect us to tell them? Is it about entertaining them? Is it about telling them only things that they will like? This is the role of media? Was it ever the role of media? Or the role of media is a very clear role, namely to inform the truth and the full truth and to criticize, yes, to criticize the government, any government. This is our mandate, to criticize whatever should be criticized and to tell the full story. Not to please our readers, not to please our viewers. Yes, many times to make them curious. But when media becomes so commercial, nothing to do with ideology in my country, or very little to do with ideology. It's mainly about this rare coalition in which the government doesn't want the full story to be published and the army doesn't want the full story to be published and the secret services don't want the full story to be published. <coughs> and the publishers don't want the full truth to be published and the journalists don't care and the readers don't want to know. So from world to world the entire society is very happy there is an elephant in the room, don't tell us about this elephant. And if you will not tell us about the elephant, the elephant maybe will disappear. Maybe the elephant doesn't exist. Maybe we will turn our head away and something will happen with this elephant. But the elephant is there and the Israeli media is not covering it. And the Israeli media is telling the Israeli readership, the Israeli viewers, that there is no elephant. And that's nothing to do with politics. It has to do with professional journalism. Because professional journalism tells the readers that the elephant is there. If they like it or even they don't like it, they must know that the elephant is there. They can say, listen, this elephant has no other place. They can say that the Israeli occupation was forced on us. They can say that Israel is the victim and the Palestinians want only to kill us. They can say that we are the victims of the Holocaust and therefore we have the right to do whatever we want. They can say anything they want, but they cannot ignore the fact that there is an elephant. And they cannot ignore the fact that they have to know the full truth. And in this way, the Israeli media, almost all of it, mainly TV and new, popular newspapers, is betraying their job. Now, if you come to Israel, you will hear from almost any Israeli that the Israeli media is leftist, that there is a leftist mafia in Israel. That's the way of the right wingers to manipulate. They do it also in other countries. I'm sure there are some Zionist organizations or individuals who will say that the Czech media is anti israeli it's a very efficient way to manipulate, to threaten, and to put pressure. Because if we are a leftist mafia, let's prove them we are not. So the truth is that the majority of Israeli journalists, each of them with his own world, I guess most of them are voting for leftist parties. I think many of them would agree with my opinions privately, but what does it matter? What really matters is what they do, and what they write, and what they say. And the fact is that in Israel there is only one narrative, in the Israeli media. Not only there is only one narrative, 
anyone who tries to suggest an alternative narrative is immediately delegitimized, immediately perceived as a traitor, immediately perceived as someone who is not legitimate. And by this, <coughs> the Israeli media is betraying its mission. A word about myself. How did I get to all this? <clears throat> I was born in Tel Aviv. I was brought up by Israeli education system, Israeli media. I was really a good boy in Tel Aviv. In the year of 67, when the occupation started, I was 14. I was so excited about liberating the occupied territories, about getting back to Hebron, to Nablus, to Jenin to the way he born in Jerusalem. I didn't see any Palestinian. I remember the first two that I don't remember I saw one Palestinian. I didn't know they are there. I didn't know there was a Nakba. I didn't know nothing. And I was not exceptional. Everyone was like this. It took me another 10 or 20 years in which I served in the Israeli army and I worked with Shimon Peres. And only in the late 80s, I started to travel to the occupied territories. Incidentally, a friend told me, when I was a journalist, a friend told me that there were some olive trees uprooted by settlers. Let's go and see it. This was the first visit, 87. And gradually, I realized two things. That the biggest drama of Israel is taking place in the occupied territories, and that there is almost no one to tell the story for the Israeli leadership. And then, gradually, I decided that I dedicate my professional career to cover the occupation, to tell the Israelis the story that they don't want to know. And the second conclusion was for me that there is no one else to tell the story. You know, the dream of every journalist is to be exclusive. Unfortunately, I'm almost always exclusive which is a privilege, obviously, but I don't enjoy it. Because in most of the cases, except of one, two, three colleagues of mine, most of them in my newspaper, not elsewhere, nobody is there. Nobody is there when Israel is executing teenagers who come with a knife to the checkpoint and could be stopped like nothing without killing them dead. Nobody is there when, on a daily basis, Israeli soldiers are penetrating private homes, bomb the doors in the middle of the night, wake up the whole family, kidnap one of the, the sons, take them to his youth, hit them, and then he can, might, he can find himself for months and months in jail without being brought to trial. Many times also tortured in interrogations. Nobody is there to cover. Nobody is there to cover the house demolitions, which are on a daily basis, mainly in the last year or two. Nobody is there to tell the Israelis what is being done on their behalf. Now, again, I must emphasize, it has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with good journalism. You have to tell the full story. And most of the Israelis don't know what is going on in the occupied territory. It's not only the betrayal of not covering the occupation and the crimes of the occupation. <coughs> it is also about a brain of system, which is systematic in Israeli media, I'm afraid to say, for so many years. Dehumanizing the Palestinians. For most of the Israelis, if you scratch a little bit under the skin, you will realize that they don't perceive the Palestinians as equal human beings like us. They wouldn't admit it, but that's the truth. <coughs> this enables us Israelis to live in peace with the occupation. Because you know, if there are not human beings like us, there's not so much problem of human rights. If there are not human beings like us, maybe we have the right to do what we do. If they were, for example, born to kill. So it's our right to protect ourselves. If they are all terrorists, it's our right to arrest all of them. And this message is being taught and delivered in the Israeli media. I guess some of you are students of journalism and you know that not opinion pieces make 
make really a change. What makes a change is the flow of information on a daily basis. And if you keep on telling a certain story on a daily basis for years, you shape the public opinion. So when the only Palestinian who is present in Israeli media is a Palestinian with a knife or with a bomb, so the average reader would think that all the Palestinians have either a knife or a bomb. When killing of hundreds of Palestinians is hardly covered, then it is not such a big deal to kill so many. Palestinians. In the last war in Gaza, two years ago, Israel killed almost 500 children. 250 out of them, I'm not very precise about the numbers, more or less, 250 of them were less than five years old, babies. 250 babies. They have faith, they have stories. For most of the Israelis, they were all terrorists. And therefore, there is no problem in killing them, obviously. <coughs> now, if you will tell an Israeli, but listen, he was three years old, how can you blame him of terrorism? So we will say, no, no. Hamas used them as human shields. Hamas was hiding behind all those babies. The media is collaborating with this version, which is an almost total lie, except of certain cases, obviously. But by and large, 500 children, 250 babies, and not to tell the story of the killing, not to be even ready to hear or to inform what happened. Families of seven, eight, nine children who were erased in this attack, not to bring the human side to tell the Israelis there were eight children playing on the beach, a bomb fall on them, a pilot pushed the bottom before he killed them. <coughs> the pilot is accountable for the killing. You can't tell it. And most of the Israeli media will not publish it. You will just see the like in a <coughs> back page statistic, which is totally inhuman. 20 Palestinians were killed today, most of them terrorists. No name, no face. No circumstances, nothing which will remind the Israeli that we are dealing with human beings. I always give this very, very radical example, which is extreme, but it should be taken into account as something symptomatic. In Operation Cast Lead, which was the former operation in Gaza, two Israeli dogs were killed. One of them was killed in a private home from a Kassam rocket. And the other dog was killed with the units, with the combats who entered Gaza. They are using dogs as well. And one dog was killed. <clears throat> the killing of those two dogs got a very nice coverage in the Israeli media. There were photos of those dogs. In one case, there was even a photo of the funeral. Soldiers standing around the grave and crying over the dog. People talking about how faithful the dog was, how clever he was, and how beautiful he was. And it was really touching. And me, who really like animals, cats more than dogs, but also dogs, <laughs> <laughs> it was touching. But in the very same days that those two dogs were killed, separated, there were two <laughs> different stories. In those very same days, there were tens of Palestinians killed on a daily basis. Now, if you put the story of the tens of Palestinians killed in page number 15, small story, no names, no images, nothing which will remind you what are we talking about. The message is very clear. A life of a Jewish dog is worth much more than tens of Palestinians killed. That's the message that the Israeli media is transferring to the readership on a daily basis. And this shapes public opinion. Because if this is the information you get, if this is the picture you are getting, your heart goes to the two Israeli dogs. And you have 
no emotions whatsoever to the real victims and those are the Palestinians. Now that's an extreme example, but there are on a daily basis examples. In the last months, as you know, it was the Knife Intifada, in which tens of Palestinians, teenagers, boys and girls, took knives, took scissors, went to the checkpoints. In many cases, they tried to stab a soldier. In a few cases, they just stood, a few girls just stood with the scissor in their hand like this, and they were all shot dead. This should have, and, and tens of Palestinians were killed like this, mainly teenagers. In a normal, healthy society, with a normal, healthy media, this should create at least a public argument. Should they all be executed? Is there no other way to stop a 16-year-old girl when there are five, six, seven soldiers in front of her, all of them armed and protected? The only way is to shoot her in her head. There's no other way. Would she be Jewish, even with a knife, would they react the same? You would expect there will be a public debate in the media. Do you think there is a debate in the Israeli media? Not at all. The information that the people are getting is exactly the information that the army wants the media to deliver. And everyone is happy about it. And so you get these absurd titles on a daily basis in Israeli newspapers. A terrorist of 12 was killed today. A terrorist of 11 was killed today. A terrorist of 16 was killed today. And then you know that there is no moral question because he was a terrorist, so sure he deserves to be killed. And nobody will go to the family and to hear what was the story of this young man, what brought him to take a knife and to go to the checkpoint. Which again is the role of the media. Because we want to know what are the motivations of those people. Why do they do it? If you want to stop it, you have to understand what motivates those people. But not in the Israeli media. For them it's enough to take the official announcement of the army spokesperson, namely a terrorist of 11 was killed today. He was trying to stab a soldier. Many times he didn't even try to stab because they don't even get into it. They shoot them much before. And no questions, no argument, nothing. This is accepted. Now this takes place in a democratic society because Israel in its own sovereign borders for its Jewish citizens is still a democracy. A liberal democracy is a free press with quite freedom of speech. I'm the best example. The fact that I gain total freedom of speech, I don't take it for granted, by the way, and it might change soon. But until now, I have total freedom. The fact that this is taking place in such freedom press doesn't make it better, make it, makes it much worse. Because with self-censorship, there is no resistance. If the communists were still here in power, and Rude Bravo would be the only newspaper, and there would be terrible pressure on Rude Bravo to write only one thing, one truth, there would be some alternative voices coming from the people to look for some alternative information, to protest, to resist, and you know it from your parents. But when this is taking place voluntarily, and everyone is Rude Bravo, almost every newspaper in Israel is playing the role of Rude Bravo in its bad times under communism. So there is also no one to resist, and no one to try to protest. And here you get the situation which the Israeli occupation next year is 50 years. A wonderful uh, celebration. 50 years, one of the longest military occupation, the longest today, 
in the world. If you don't, <coughs> uh, if you don't count uh, Kashmir, which is also a military occupation, and you face an Israeli society who has almost no moral doubts, no questions, who feels very good about itself, with a majority, vast majority, big majority of Israelis who are sure that the IDF, the Israeli army, is the most moral army in the world. Many times I say, maybe it's the second moral army in the world. You know, an army which kills hundreds of children, let's say it's the second moral army in the world. Maybe the army of Luxembourg is more moral. Israelis will not accept it. How can you dare to think that the Israeli army is not the most moral army in the world? And they read it in their newspapers and they hear it on TV on a daily basis. This is the most moral army in the world. The only army who calls people in Gaza and tells them, we are going to bomb your house within three minutes, evacuate the house. What morality is more than this? Most of Israelis really believe in it. And the media is collaborating with it. And when I say media, it's the entire Israeli media, except of my newspaper and some alternative websites, which is a new phenomenon. So the whole people lives in peace with this occupation, which is committing crimes, believe me, on a daily basis. But really, when, now we, when we sit now here, the occupation is committing its crimes in the West Bank and Gaza. Either a fisherman is shot in Gaza now, or a house is being demolished, or soldiers will come to kidnap because they do it every night to arrest without any basis, tens of young people. You know that one million Palestinians were in the Israeli jail throughout the 50 years? One million Palestinians. There's not one single home in Palestine that at least one son was not in jail. This is normal. Does the Israeli media cover it? And then you face a society which not only lives in peace with this reality, but thinks also that we are the victims. It's the only occupation in history which perceives himself as the victim. We <coughs> did not do this occupation. It was forced on us. And again, the media collaborates with this narrative. It was the late Golda Meir, Prime Minister of Israel, who once said this unbelievable sentence that we will never forgive the Palestinians for forcing us to kill their children. Understand the logic? We will not forgive the Palestinians for forcing us to kill their children. We are the victims. We kill their children, but we are the victims. Because they force us to kill their children. And the media collaborates. And the media will deliver this message. Because the readers want to read it and they don't want to read something else. Because there is only one publisher in Israel who is ready to pay the price. I wrote an article in the war in Gaza blaming the Israeli pilots for their accountability for killing the children and the women in Gaza. After this article, hundreds of subscribers of Haaretz canceled their subscription. The damage to Haaretz was almost of one million dollars. Haaretz is a very small newspaper, not very rich. Really an economical catastrophe, a disaster. The people in the commercial uh, department in Haaretz hate me. But the publisher said, no, no, that's our role. We will continue to publish it. We will continue to publish the truth. And he's a private publisher. People would call him and say, we want to cancel our subscription because, subscription because of this given lady. He would say to them, you know what, Haaretz is it for you. Go and find yourself another newspaper. The publisher speaks like this. While most of the publishers will just look how to make more money. So, when Haaretz is the only voice, and Believe me, I'm not doing here any advertisement for Haaretz. It's a matter of fact. 
Nobody can argue that Haaretz is the only media in Israel which is really fulfilling its job, not only about the occupation, but about many other subjects. We are not dealing now only really about the occupation. I, for me, it's the main issue, but there are so many other issues. When you see, see a media that reacts like this, many times I come to the conclusion, how can we blame the Israelis for accepting the occupation? Maybe they are not such bad people, they just don't know anything. Maybe this is true also in your country. Maybe people just don't know the truth. And it is our role, journalists, to tell them the full truth, and the whole truth, no matter what they think about it. And I say again, I can inform about the crimes of the occupation, and many people can draw any kind of conclusion out of it. I will appreciate if people will say the Palestinians deserve it. I will appreciate people who will say the Palestinians are to be blamed because it's their responsibility. I will appreciate if people will say that's the only way to fight terror. That's all fine with me. What is, un what is unacceptable that you, Israeli reader, will not know what is being done on your behalf, that you will not know that people are arrested, executed, houses are demolished, and so forth, and so forth. You have to know it, if you like it or not. You have not the privilege not to know. This is not a privilege of someone in democracy. In democracy, people have to know everything. And the media has a role far beyond selling more copies or having more viewers. It has a role to make the people know if they like it or not. And the media in many countries is betraying its role and it's becoming worse and worse because the more the media is struggling for its life and you know very well that in your country, in my country, private media is struggling now for its life, mainly printed newspapers but not only. It's a very harsh struggle and still we have to remember that the media, journalism, <coughs> is not producing washing machines. It's not about selling more shoes. It's not about promoting more alcohol. It's about serving a role in democracy. A role that we cannot release ourselves from our responsibility. And unfortunately, in many cases, we betray our responsibility. And this is very regrettable. Last sentence before I let you ask your questions. The question that I can raise here is if the Israelis or the Czechs would have known everything, would, would they have changed their views? It's an open question because we don't know the answer, we never tried. Because neither the Czechs nor the Israelis have ever really known the full truth. My guess is that if more people of conscience would have known, they would have changed their views. I always say, if I could take, if I could only take any Israeli with me for one day to the occupied territories, because most of the Israelis have never been there. If I could only take you one day to Hebron, to the Jordan Valley, to show that they are part of it in their own eyes, to see it with their own eyes. I'm sure that most of the Israelis, not all of them, but most of the Israelis, those who, who are willing to, to see reality, would have changed their mind. The problem is that the agent between reality and the citizens, <coughs> the agent, which is the media, is not fulfilling its job in transmitting the reality, the full reality, to its consumers. I'd be very happy to answer the question. Thank you very much.